Verse 1, And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign, note that there, a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer to them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up the twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. We'll see later, that's Gilgal in the end of the chapter. Verse 9, then Joshua set up. Now, this is kind of unusual. Maybe you've read this chapter before and didn't understand this, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a bit. But this seems like, arguably, a separate set of 12 stones, if you've never noticed that before. But listen to what Joshua does here in verse 9. Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan and in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood. And they are there to this day. Obviously a reference to the day of the writing of this book. So the priests who bore the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed over. And then it came to pass... When all the people had completely crossed over, that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people. And the men, we're going to read the whole thing. And the men of Reuben and the men of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, you remember those are the three, two and a half tribes that had already arrived at their promised land on the east side of the Jordan. They were following through here with their promise to Moses. So these men crossed over armed, ready for battle, together with the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. How many? Verse 13, about 40,000 prepared for war across over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses. In the same way that they had respect and awe of Moses, they had the same for Joshua on this day, all the days of his life, Moses' life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan, Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet touched the dry, gr land, dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as they were before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east side of the border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they had took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Remember now it's a reference to another set of stones that are getting stacked. Joshua is setting up both, set, both sets of stones. My conviction, it's two separate sets. Verse 21, then he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their father in time to come saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did in the Red Sea when we come out of Egypt, remember, which he dried up before us and we had crossed over. That, verse 24, the final verse here, all the people of the Lord may know that the hand of the Lord, that his mighty hand, that you may fear uh, uh, the Lord your God forever. I mentioned this last week, I emphasize it quite a bit, and I'll reintroduce us before we cross the Jordan again with the people as we did last week in chapter three. I mentioned to you that the promised land, let's reference it specifically, God called it the land of Canaan, right? We call it Canaan. We also call it what? The 
promised land, right? And, and there's a group of Christianity out there, not as much as there was perhaps in the Middle Ages or Dark Ages, but um, there was, there's a popular theology out there that it, it serves as a type or a picture of heaven, which is our ultimate promised land. And I've made a case, and, I, and I'm going to make that case a little bit deeper and stronger tonight, that that is actually wrong. That's, we should never look at Canaan for Israel as a type or similar to the promises that we have in heaven waiting for us. Um, in fact, uh, I, I remembered studying a book a while ago by a, a, an amazing uh, British preacher who pastored a church in California for many years by the name of Alan Redpath. You ever heard of Alan Redpath? I highly recommend if you want to read a really good book on this book of Joshua, he has a book called Victorious Christian Living. Excellent study on the book of Joshua, Victorious Christian Living. Highly recommend it. Um, let me give you a couple quotes of his from that book. He says, I would suggest that the clue to the interpretation of this Old Testament book is found in the epistle of Ephesians and in the epistle to the Hebrews. For example, in the third and fourth chapters of Hebrews, we find that the land of Canaan is a picture of the spiritual rest, spiritual rest, not heaven, and victory. That's why he calls it the victorious Christian life, which may be enjoyed here on earth by every believer, a rest of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the Ephesian letter now speaks of life in, quote, the heavenly places, close quote, not in heaven but in the experience of oneness with our risen Lord in his victory here and now. The place of the fullness of God's blessing. You remember me kind of talking about how I look at the promised land for us as a type of where we eventually find our place of bearing fruit, where we sink roots, where we absorb, where we get into the God's flow and we're serving him and worshiping him. And kind of a lot of people look at it like, hey, I finally, I found my church, I'm plugged in. I'm connecting with the Lord there, I'm serving, I'm also worshiping, I'm receiving and I'm giving and I'm all these things come together and we begin our lives to bear fruit. Compared to a life of some Christians of wandering in the wilderness on the other side of the Jordan where they never seem to be bearing fruit. Are they saved? Sure. But for various reasons, they never quite find themselves at the edge of the Jordan looking to cross over. A lot of times it's about not willing, being willing to face their sinfulness and confess and repent. And they recognize to cross the Jordan, God wants them to deal and confess and be honest about sin. And for various reasons, or for other reasons maybe, perhaps a lack of faith, uh, too much of a self-focus, woe is me. I've seen it all. He goes on to say, I believe that we shall understand the real significance of the book of Joshua only if we recognize that what it is in the Old Testament is the, is the epistle to the Ephesians in the New. This suggestion, of course, has to be sustained by the word of God itself, which I believe it is. He says in another spot in the same writing, he says, the land of Can Canaan is a picture of the spirit-filled life that God intended for every Christian to live. There are no exceptions to this. The spirit-filled life is not just for certain advanced saints, but it is provided by God for every one of his people. Listen very carefully. Canaan, or the promised land, is not where pastors live. It's not where the elders live. It's where everybody who's a believer in Christ can and, sh and God wants you to live. God wants you all to connect with your promised land, whatever that might be. So, so listen, and, and when you do, what's the first thing we read in Joshua chapter 4? What, what are we focusing on? When you arrive at this place of promise, what does God have them do? Memorial stones. So that they never forget, not what Joshua did, not what the army did, not what the priests did, what God did. You'll see that as we look. Let's go back through it again. And it came to pass, verse 1, when all the people had come completely across over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua again, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from a place where the priest's feet stood firm. So right around the spot, which, we seem, which seems to be, we always, we always thought, well, they walked out just into the edge, into the water. Yes, we gave them credit for that. But we were always thinking, well, yeah, it's, they all, as, as soon as all their feet were wet, they stopped. Well, later on in this chapter, it kind of seems like they walked out into the middle. 
And remember that the Jordan here is, is it's overflowed its banks, so it's much wider than it normally would be. So they're somewhere out in the midst of the Jordan, standing there, and this is the spot. The water has stopped. The 12 men that Joshua had selected, take for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood, firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them, not on, just on the other side, but at the lodging place where you would lodge tonight. Now, later on in the chapter, we see at the end of the chapter, that place is called Gilgal, but not at this time. It had no name at this point, the place where it later on became Gilgal. And if you look at your Bible maps, it's a very odd place that God would bring them to this place, which is just east of Jericho. In fact, I would argue that from the top of the hill and from the top of the walls of Jericho, you could probably see these couple million Jews now camping just off your eastern wall. Can you imagine this? You're crossing the Jordan with women and children, carts, older folks, food, your tents, and you're making camp just outside of Jericho. This is, you know, you're, these people do not want you there, and you know it. Now, we're going to see later on in chapter 5 that they're actually, they, they don't know, the Jews don't know it at this point, but God has caused great fear to fall upon all the inhabitants of the land because they heard that the waters of the Jordan stopped to let God's people across. They're quivering in their boots. Listen, don't be afraid of your enemies because God can cause them to be deathly afraid of you because of his presence with you. Verse 4, Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, said this to them, cross over before the Ark of the Covenant your, of, of your Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone upon his shoulder. And every time I see this, take up a stone upon, I think of the photograph that we have of Matt when we were in the Valley of Elah there, the Valley of Elah uh, was where, you know, where David slew Goliath. And we were standing in a creek bed, which is right around the area that is the most likely spot where David came down off the hill, gathered up five smooth stones. You remember the story? Well, Matt decided he was going to pick one up, and he, he's got this big stone on his shoulder. It's like this big, you know, and we're all picking up five, five stones, and he's picking up this one big one. We're like, uh, we, we call, started calling him Goliath after that, but... Um, just makes me think of that. But these were stones big enough that they needed their shoulder to carry it. It wasn't one hand. It wasn't pick up a stone. It's something you could throw. And so cross over, large stones, 12 in all, carry them to the place where you'll camp tonight, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, 12, one for each of the tw tribes, so that everyone and all their fathers would always be remembered. You'll notice also at the end of the chapter, when... God tells them through Joshua why those stones are there. I don't know if you noticed this as I was reading, but when he was speaking sort of in the second person to people who would one day ask, people who aren't even in this story yet, they're probably not even born. He says of them, this is where you crossed over. In other words, their fathers are the same as them, right? Right? And there's that connection to those who have gone before them as though they were crossing over with the father. So in other words, they're connecting all the way back to Gad, to Ephraim, to Dan, to all their forefathers. They, they see themselves as connected to everything, all these promises of God that's all being passed down. Verse 6, um, why? Because God's faithful to every one of those he hadn't forgotten any of them. He doesn't want them to forget their forefathers. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you, apparently? A sign among you. It's a sign among you. God is okay with signs. You know, not stop, not, you know, that kind of, I, I mean, literal signs where God makes a sign for you, where it's something that you look at and you say, that was God, that was a sign to me. These things are acquired by faith, they're believed by faith. I hear you guys talk about, well, I saw this and God, I thought God was saying this, you know, I, do you think that was God, Pastor John? I don't know. You tell me. Whether it was or whether it was bad pizza you ate the night before, I don't know. Here's what I do know is that when you exercise faith, 
And even when you're wrong, you're exercising faith, believing that God has spoken to you and you end up being wrong, God is pleased. Because you're responding and and you're living a life of faith. You're looking, you're listening, you're wanting God to speak. You know? I got saved in a very conservative church and, um, you know, they didn't accept any of that stuff. They just didn't believe in any of it, you know? And they were what, they would, what we would call cessationists. They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They don't believe in, in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But then there are those on the far end of the spectrum, on the opposite side, who sort of believe that almost anything is the Holy Spirit, you know? And they sort of over-spiritualize everything. Well, listen, I don't want to be either of those because the Bible doesn't seem to represent either of those. So what we want to do is learn to truly be led by God. That's what this story is about. It's about people who were believing God's promises. Could you imagine if none of these people actually believed in God's promises? They would never end up in Canaan because they wouldn't believe God was going to give it to them. They they would have heard the report of all the spies. I mean, the spies brought back, the giants, all that stuff. They never would have come to their place of calling and rest and blessing and spiritual oneness with God had they not believed. They had to first believe, and they had to go on faith. Sometimes all you have is faith in the promises of God. Amen? Amen. So that this may be a sign among you when the children ask in time to come what these stones mean, a memorial stone. So do we have a modern equivalent of memorial stones? You know what, folks? If you make notes in your Bible, that's a, that's a kind of a memorial stone. If you have a journal, um, if you're the kind of person that's visual, you, you, um, some people, uh, I think it was Nick and Donna, they were on the Romney uh, mission trip several years ago, and they, they grabbed a stone. Who painted on the stone? Who did that? Do you remember? Anyway, some, somebody painted Romney in the year that you guys went, and, you know, and that's out in our garden right here. That's a, that's a stone. It's a memorial stone for some missions work that you guys did. Probably. It sounds like something he would do. <laughs> anyway, he, he's, he's artistic that way, and he's, he it looks like something he probably would have made. Anyway, verse 7, memorial stones, right? Then you shall answer them, those that ask you, what are these stones about? That the waters of the Jordan were cut off, that a miracle happened before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, which represented the presence of God, right, in their midst, When the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial stone to the children of Israel forever. Uh, Our tendency, what is our tendency, though, with memorial stones? Our humanistic nature, what do we do? You see it, yeah, you start worshiping the memorial stones. That's when memorial stones become monuments. Monuments aren't good. I think you guys remember me covering this quite a bit when I taught through Exodus, right? Memorial stones, good. Monuments, bad. What a monument. If undealt with, monuments become mountains. Mountains in between. God's on the other side. You're on, the, you're on this side. God's on the other side. And they just in the way because you can't see God anymore because all you can see is your monument. And it's a monument to you and the history of your people, you know? It's all about you now. It's all about your identity. When it ceases to be about God and what God did, it becomes a monument. Never make that mistake. Never make that mistake. Any memorial must always be about God and what God did. Verse 8, And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, one for every tribe, carried them over with them, Note again, to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up, look at this right now, verse 9. This seems to be a different stack of stones. You see what I'm saying here? Do you guys notice this? Look at verse 9. Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. Where is he setting them up? Not in Gilgal, not near Jericho, in the midst of the Jordan. And so that you further understand what he's doing, it says, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they're there to this day. In other words, this is a separate set of stones. So to, he's setting up right where God stood still in the midst of the Jordan. There was a stack of stones. And then all the way up where they would make camp that night, miles away in Gilgal, another set of stones that one, of the other man, one man from each of the 12 tribes would carry all the way to Gilgal. 
So it, it seems to me that the memorial was in two places. There was a memorial in two different places. Uh, just blows me away. Blows me away. Because why? Memorials are good. They're not a bad thing. Just as long as we don't trust in the memorial. We trust, you know, we look back at it as something that, that God did. Verse 8, and the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded. Oh, I'm sorry, verse, no, that's it. Just as God, uh, they took up the 12 stones, just as God had commanded. The Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of tribes, to the place where they lodged, it might be inferred by the text that, um, that uh, there were two sets of stones, which is what I have come to accept and believe. Um, okay, so verse 10. So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people. According to all that Moses had commanded, Joshua and the people hurried across. I like this little note here that Joshua adds, hurried across. First of all, it says that it says to me that he was he was the one watching um, and recalling, remembering as he's writing, not just that they crossed, but how they crossed. You follow what I'm saying? It's kind of like a little personal note. It seems like I've been watching these people walk for days and days and days across deserts, but, they're, but now they're walking differently. They're moving quickly. And it seems to me that there's a sense of urgency. Now, you can give them spiritual credit and say they just can't wait to get to, the, to Canaan, or you can sort of give them, you can, you can sort of say, oh, no, no, they were afraid that the water could start coming at any time. But whatever the reason, this is a very cool little picture that Joshua is telling us what it looked like to him as he's recalling watching the people. And I, when I think about that, I think, man, when I see milestones in your lives, I, I sort of characterize the different way in which you walk when you're crossing Jordans, you know, for yourself and your own walk with the Lord. But that was my own little, my own little moment of joy that I get to see as well. Anyway, verse 11, it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the priests also crossed over in the presence of the people and the men of, these are the two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, Half of the tribe of Manasseh also crossed over, armed before the children of Israel, as Moses had spoken to them. You might remember that was Joshua 1, chapter 1, verse 14. That even though on the east side of the Jordan where they had been camped for the past three days, even though this was going to be their promised land, Moses had encouraged them, look, if if you're going to take your promise land, that's fine but you still have to cross the Jordan and help conquer the land for the rest of your brothers and sisters because you're one. Solidarity. I think that sets a strong precedent for us as believers. When one suffers or struggles or battles, we all must come around that one and fight with that person or mourn with that person or rejoice with that person. We're one. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. And so with whatever gifts or abilities or skills you have, Suffer with those who suffer. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Fight with those who have to fight. Um, just, like, just like Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, right? Verse 13, about 40,000 prepared for war, crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. So after perhaps the most unorthodox military border crossing in the history of mankind, Right? Send the priests out with the ark first. Everybody else, wait. Wait a minute, what? Yeah, yeah. You mean, aren't we supposed to like build a bridge, get the army across, have them go and make sure it's safe, then send the priests? No, 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 the Lord says. And Joshua, the great military commander Joshua, send the priests out with the ark. Have them stand in the water. This is all about teaching us that God has to go first in everything. And that everything that God is going to lead us to do isn't going to look the way the world does things. Sometimes it might. But when God leads and guides, oftentimes he wants to get the credit for things. Because he'll know what to do with it. You see, if we get the glory, not only don't we know what to do with it, but we'll be like Peter walking on the water. What the heck am I doing? We'll sink. So it has to be about the Lord. And the way the Lord does things sometimes is completely different than the way the world does things. And it causes people to look at us and go, what are they thinking? That is never going to work. They are going to fall flat on their face. Their enemies are going to destroy them. And so after about the most unorthodox military crossing, 
of a border, of a, of a, into a, another land, in a, into enemy territory, what happens next, as we'll see next week in chapter 5, verse 2, I'll show you, I'll tell you now, you don't have to, you could turn there if you'd like, it's one page. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, now, I know, I'm going to see, this is what's going to happen, watch, the guys are going to start to go like this. I'm going to start to get uncomfortable. The girls are going to snicker. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. <laughs> Take some sharp rocks. I don't, want to, I don't want to paint the picture with birds. It's not necessary. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at, at the hill of the foreskins. Now, you just crossed over with the most unorthodox military crossing in the history of mankind. And what's the first thing you do? Incapacitate all your, your battle-ready young men. Completely incapacitate them. Why? Glad you asked. Verse 6, Joshua 5. Till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us. See, all those who were 20 and below were allowed to one day come in to the land of Israel, to Canaan. All those who were 20, I'm sorry, 20 and above were not. So all those who were 19 and below were allowed to come in. But those, because they'd wandered in the wilderness, were never circumcised. Their fathers were, when they came out of the land of Egypt, they were all circumcised. But because those were the men of war, those were the ones who by faith were supposed to cross and acquire the land by faith in God, because God said it was theirs. And, even, and, and who's leading them? One of the two spies, Joshua, who said, come on, let's go, it's ours. Who cares what's there? God said it's ours, let's take it. That was 40 years ago. Here it's 40 years later. And finally, the one who had faith is leading them in. You get this? It's, it's about faith. It's about believing God's promises and, and actually believing that God wants to give you something good. He wants to be good in your life. And so all those who had died in the wilderness, who were 40 and above, the men of war had died in the wilderness, who are 20 and above, excuse me, 40 years of, of wandering the wilderness would not be entering in, but their sons would. And verse 14, now back in, in uh, our chapter, chapter 4, on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him. That's a small H there. You see that? They feared him, not God, Joshua, as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Understand something, that the way God works is he chooses um, a leader, raises up, ordains, anoints a leader to lead people. That's how God works. It's always been that way. But he chooses sovereignly by his own choice. God chooses not based on anything that's human that we would admire. Not, he doesn't choose based on somebody's intelligence. He doesn't choose based on someone's influence over others or their political connections or their good looks. Or Obviously, you could tell he's chosen me. Or he doesn't choose for any earthly reason. God chooses how God chooses. And then God establishes and empowers those people. When I say empowers, I mean that when, when something is needed, they have it. When wisdom is required to lead, they have it. Uh, and I can only tell you from my experience, when God calls me to step in and to lead in some way, I'm always uncomfortable in the moment because it's not natural. You need to understand, you might look at me and think I'm a natural leader, that everything I do comes naturally to me. It does not come naturally to me. Bible teaching and preaching does not come natural to me. I usually don't know what I'm going to say until I start preaching. I mean, I study, don't get me wrong. I do. I look hard at the scriptures and I, and I study and I get sort of the gist of what, what, what's going to happen when we get into the Word of God. But I'm telling you right now that God gives me words. I, I just, He leads and guides me. I often end up saying things I never anticipated. And it's because God empowers he just, if you, if you 
accept the calling that God puts on your life, he will give you what you need to accomplish the goal because he doesn't ever want you depending on yourself for anything. That is the key to why I'm a pastor today is because I know, and the first moment I actually knew I was, I was going to make it as a pastor was the first moment I realized I didn't have anything in myself to accomplish the task. My inability became my empowerment because it became a dependence on him for all things. But how does God establish Joshua in the sight of the people that they would respect? Let's use that word for a second. Because when this is the same word that when it says that the people feared God, I think it means that they had a sense of awe or respect for God. Now, they have that same word for Joshua, but not in the same way. They don't see Joshua as the source of authority and power. But they do see him as a channel through which the authority and power comes. Do you understand that? And they accept him in that role because God establishes. Let's look at just four ways. Well, one, Joshua prophesied. What do I mean by that? He heard from God and told the people what God said. Only what God said. He didn't try to interpret it for them and add to it how he thought it would look. He didn't try to make it feel comfortable for people. He didn't try to pump them up and convince them that, come on, let's get behind me, let's do this. He just said, this is what God said, and that's what we're going to do. He kept himself out of it and said, this is God, and that's what we're going to do. So number two, he worshipped. Joshua worshipped. How did Joshua worship? He obeyed God's instruction, his personal obedience Even though it defied human or worldly wisdom, he obeyed God. God established Joshua because of Joshua's obedience to God. It's one of the ways that we see examples here. Third thing I saw, through signs, through miracles, signs. God uses miracles. Miracles that were accompanying Joshua's actions of obedience. You see, he prophesied when he said that we're going we're gonna to send these guys out carrying the ark. They're going to stand in the water, and God's going to stop the water. Now, he, he believed God told him to say that, so he said it. It's kind of a big risk, don't you think? Hey, everybody, listen, this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk down to, to the beach, about a mile walk, you know, till we get to the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> then some of you, I'm going to have you, you know, carry carry something. We're going to carry something out there that represents God, and, we're going to, and I'm going to have you walk out into the, to the Atlantic. And then after you do that, you know, the Atlantic's going to dry up. We're all going to walk across to Ireland and go do some summer ministry, and then we'll come back. Not one of you would follow me. Well, you might follow me for a laugh. But that's literally what they're saying. Of course, the Atlantic is not a good representation of the Jordan. I get it. Literally, he's got to cross a couple million people with all their belongings, old, young, kids, across a swelling river during the time of harvest. It's just overflowing its banks, you know, 10 times as wide as it normally would be. It's just huge. And so how am I going to, you know, the people are like, we're going to do what? How are we going to get across? That's how we're going to get across. No wavering. He just says, that's what God said. That's what we're going to do. I've had examples like this. God said, this is what I want you to do. And I thought to myself, I'm going to get criticized for this. People are going to criticize me for this decision. But this is what God said to do. And so I've done what God said to do. And i got to tell you, I have a clear conscience. And people do criticize. But I have a clear conscience because I did what God said to do. And as a result, people will trust in God's anointing because of that. Uh, So Joshua worship. And then the signs. And then lastly, I notice, and there, this isn't an exhaustive list, as I just pondered this passage. These are the four that came to my mind. So the, the fourth one I see is the memorials themselves. As a monument to what God did, yet, or as a memorial to what God did, yes, not as a monument, as a memorial to what God did, but also as a memorial to how God used Joshua to do it. Joshua made sure, and then here's his, a sign of leadership, Joshua made sure that the story of this event would never be forgotten and that it was about God and what God did and not what Joshua did. 
Because as he tells this story, as he writes this story down in this book and we read it now, he says, this is what you're to tell people who ask. This is what God did to get your people across. And you see, these are, to me, the marks of someone who's been called by God to lead. Someone, they don't point to themselves. They point to God. They, they speak what they believe God has said. They're faithful. They're, they worship God. Verse 15. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. Okay, it's time to get up out of the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come up out of the Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet touched dry ground. Now, they were dry ground, obviously, in the midst of the Jordan, because it literally says they walked out and the, the ground was dry. They, as the, the water was dried up, so was the ground dry. As everybody crossed over, it was on dry ground. What he's talking about here is clearly up on the riverbanks, the ground that, that wasn't getting wet before, right? The, the ground that normally would be dry. And the waters of the Jordan then, now that the priests are up and out, return to their place and begin to overflow its banks as they were before. So the miracle here was to serve a purpose. The miracle itself served a purpose. It was a sign, but it also served a practical purpose to transfer well over a million, closer to two plus million people across the River Jordan. Once done, the return of the natural course of the flow of the waters of the Jordan, the return of it was every bit as significant a miracle as its receding. Why? Because of the timing. It didn't return until right after they got up on the banks and then they were allowed to flow again. Again, to me, it's got God written all over it and everything about it says God. Now, verse 19, the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and then they camped in Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Now, I've been there. Jericho is quite a distance from Jordan. I don't mean like a long, 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 long drive, but it'll be a very, very long walk. It's not a short walk. Uh, we, didn't go near Jordan, or we didn't go near Jericho because Jericho right now is very much an Arab city that's hostile. Um, so we, didn't, we went by it, passed it. We saw the turnoff to go to Jericho. We didn't go down that road. It's a road you don't go down today. I would have loved to have gone and checked out the ruins of Jericho. They still have the, the ruins there. But <clears throat> they go right from wandering right to, the, right to the precipice of war, from wandering to war. And again, the 12 stones which they took from the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Again, it would seem to me a second set of stones. Then we're going to wrap up with these last three verses. Then the Lord spoke to the children of Israel, four verses or three verses? Three verses. Then the Lord spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you will let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. Notice, see the you, as I was pointing out before, your, you, you crossed over the Jordan <clears throat> as if they were there. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did also to the Red Sea, which he had dried up before us until we had crossed over. Verse 24, we'll close with this now that the people, all the people of earth may know. Now, this is important. This is, in fact, one of, the, one of the themes of the major prophets, that the people of earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that, his mighty, that he is mighty, uh, that, that you may fear the Lord your God forever, so that everyone will know, that you will know, and that the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. Um, do you know that for yourself? today? Is he mighty for you to today? You know, Are you believing? Are you trusting? Are you struggling? And it's okay to struggle, but just struggle with your faith, not with God, your faith in God, with your own personal faith, and confess it to him, and he'll lift you up. Amen?